Yes, go ahead. We are all here. Yeah. Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Gotswe Koku Tete, hopefully I'll pronounce your name correctly, will defend your academic thesis, the economic outcomes of financial innovation and digital infrastructure in Sub-Saharan Africa. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. The floor is yours. Dear Prorector, dear members of, of the Corona, dear family, friends, and the audience, in the next 15 minutes, I'll present a summary and the main conclusions of my dissertation entitled, The Economic Outcomes of Financial Innovation and Digital Infrastructure in Sub-Saharan Africa. Globally, it's estimated that around 1.4 billion adults are without access to formal financial services. And in Sub-Saharan Africa alone, this number is estimated around 165 million, meaning that this segment of the population do not have access to financial services. The existence of few bank branches in poor neighborhoods and also in rural areas compound this challenge, making financial transactions costly and also limited access to credit for entrepreneurs and also households. This in turn leads to adverse effect on firms, households, and the economy. Over the last two decades, Africa has witnessed an expansion in mobile phone access. For example, whilst in 1999, mobile phone coverage was around 10%, this number has increased to 44% in 2018 and is expected to even increase further to 50% by the year 2025. Interestingly, 56% of those with, without access to formal financial services already have access to mobile phones in sub-Saharan Africa. And this presents a huge opportunity for digital financial innovations to emerge. A typical example of this innovation is mobile money which typically started in the sub-region in Kenya before spreading to other parts of, of sub-Saharan Africa. With mobile money, you don't, need, you don't need to open bank account, but with your mobile phone, you are able to transfer funds from one geographical location to the other. This led to major financial inclusion gains, making sub-Saharan Africa the global leader in the provision of mobile money. Given this transformation, the interesting question that we'll ask is to what extent are these transformation contributing to economic outcomes of digital transformation? To respond to this important question, this thesis has come up with four main objectives. First, to unravel the effect of mobile money among formal firms and also to extend this analysis to the informal sector. And third, to understand the welfare implications of digital lending development. And finally, the contribution of digital infrastructure to service sector employment. Accordingly, chapter two focuses on mobile money, traditional financial services, and firm productivity in Africa. The literature suggests that firms especially formal firms are beginning to use mobile money for their day-to-day -day transaction, meaning that traditional financial services and mobile money coexist, each with unique advantages. For example, whereas mobile money is advantageous in transactions that are low value, traditional bank services are more advantageous for high value transactions. However, we do not know how the interaction between this financial innovation and traditional financial services affect firm level outcomes such as productivity. To contribute to this literature, this chapter examines whether mobile money can accentuate or enhance the effect of traditional finance, 
and also tests for this effect among small and medium-sized enterprises and extend this analysis outside East Africa as well, where mobile money is emerging. To estimate our result, we depend on the World Bank Enterprise Survey across 14 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, where the mobile money question is available. And using ordinary least square regression, we show that traditional finance has a positive effect on labor productivity consistent with the literature. Again, we find that mobile money has no direct significant effect on labor productivity, but when it is combined with traditional finance, such as bank capital and also bank accounts, then there is productivity improvement. This means that mobile money can help enhance the effect of traditional financial services on firm productivity. This evidence is also found among small and medium-sized enterprises and also in regions where mobile money is emerging. In chapter three, we look at mobile money adoption and entrepreneurs' access to trade credit in the informal sector. Indeed, it is not undeniable fact that in a typical developing country economy, entrepreneurs, especially informal entrepreneurs, face major constraints to growth. One of these constraints is access to external finance. And one of the ways that entrepreneurs can mitigate this constraint is to depend on trade credit. That's access to goods and services on credit, and by extension also, the likelihood to provide the same to customers. Mobile money is expected to improve trade credit relationship since given that it's a payment instrument, it can facilitate transaction at low cost and therefore improving the liquidity position of firms to be able to offer and also receive credit. However, the effect of mobile money on trade credit in the informal sector is yet to be explored. So as a contribution, we show the effect of mobile money to the informal sector while highlighting mobile money's influence on access to trade credit, looking at both the likelihood to receive and also the propensity to offer. To estimate our results, we use the 2016 Fin Access Household Survey of Kenya where we simultaneously estimate the decision to use mobile money for transaction, the choice to receive credit, and also the likelihood to offer credit to customers. Our findings suggest that entrepreneurs with mobile money are more likely to receive credit, and also those who use mobile money for transactions are also more likely to offer credit to customers. And one of the mechanisms that we found is that transaction costs matter for this relationship, suggesting that entrepreneurs who transact using mobile money do so at low transaction costs, and therefore their liquidity position improves and they are able to offer or receive credit. In chapter four, we look at local digital lending development and the incidence of deprivation. Despite the emergence of digital credit and Sub-Saharan Africa, there's limited evidence on local digital lending development and how this relates to welfare, especially to underserved areas such as rural communities. And to contribute to this literature, first, we estimate local digital lending development, which is the ease with which an individual or household can access loans to their mobile phones. And also we relate this effect on how this affects welfare at the household level. And also shows the implication for rural inhabitants. To estimate our result, we use data from the 2016 and 2019 Fin Access Household Survey of Kenya. And based on multi-level regression, our findings suggest that local digital lending development decreases the likelihood of food deprivation on one hand and also health deprivation on the other. And that rural communities benefit more from this effect. In chapter five, we look at digital infrastructure and employment in services. Sub-Saharan Africa 
has sweetness boom in the service sector and digitalization has been touted as one of the contributing factors to this boom. However, the evidence on the interlinkages between digitalization and service sector employment is limited. And to contribute to this literature, we examine the effect of digital infrastructure on service sector employment. We also show the relevance of institutional factors and also macroeconomic conditions on this relationship. We depend on data, panel data comprising 45 sub-Saharan African countries covering the period 1996 to 2017. We, we compare this data from the World Bank Development Indicators and also at the IMF Statistic Database. Using panel fixed effect regression and instrumental variable techniques, we show that digital infrastructure contribute to service sector employment. And that this effect tend to increase as institutional quality becomes better. In this case, control of corruption, meaning that the effect of digital infrastructure is more enhanced in countries that has control of corruption. We also find a base of the pyramid effect that countries at low levels of education also tends to benefit more from digital infrastructure. And this shows that digital infrastructure has a potential to, to be more inclusive or to bring more people into the, uh, to the employment in the service sector. However, macro or poor macro conditions tend to decrease this effect. And for example, inflation tends to decrease the effect of digital infrastructure on service sector employment. And therefore countries ought to be aware of this and take the necessary measures. Chapter six, we provide the concluding remarks. Based on our findings, we propose that countries combine or facilitate the use of both mobile money and traditional financial services among formal firms. For example, this can be achieved via bank to mobile money interoperability, meaning that consumers or businesses are able to transfer money from their mobile money wallet into their bank account and vice versa. This will lead to reduction in transaction costs. And the informal sector, we propose that informal payments that are usually done in cash are digitized. This will improve access to financial services, especially to, to those that are excluded. In addition, we also recommend that policies are put in place to improve financial literacy and also digital skills of in, informal entrepreneurs, not forgetting the importance of consumer protection to ensure that the benefit of financial inclusion does not harm um, those that are inclu included in the financial services provision. Third, we recommend decentralization of financial inclusion policies. For example, where local initiatives are encouraged at local government level to respond to financial constraints, such as access to identification and also other supply side factors as uh, provision of mobile money services by agent. And fourth, we also recommend that countries invest in digital infrastructure, and this must go hand in hand with complementary policies that will control corruption. Direction for future research. One of the limitations of the studies that we've not looked at all firm performance indicators among formal firms. And so we recommend that future studies look at the interaction between mobile money and traditional finance and how this relates to firm growth. Also, the effect of digital infrastructure on the informal sector would be worth to explore. And therefore we recommend that future studies pay particular attention to this effect. Thank you for your attention. And I'll give the floor back to the co-rector. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, the opposition will be uh, opened by Professor Dr. Robin Cohen.
who is a professor of the economics of technical change at this university, but who also acted as chair of the assessment committee. So the floor goes to Professor Cohen. Thank you, Prorector. Dear candidate, <clears throat> dear Godswe, congratulations on finishing your thesis. It was a very interesting piece of work, which I enjoyed reading quite a bit. You didn't pick this up, but uh, I'll just point out that it contributes to a debate that has been carried on between members of our institute, um, some of the older members, about whether or not um, the new technologies will allow emerging economies to follow a different development path than traditionally has been followed. Um, and if I lean hard on what you're saying, the answer that you would go to is yes, but I won't push you in that direction. I will take you in a different direction because I know that was not your concern. I just point out that this is an interesting, can turn into an interesting contribution of an ongoing debate. Um, what I would like to talk to you about, ask you about particularly is chapter four. I liked chapter four um, because you, you have picked up, you focused on health and food, which uh, are in a sense the fundamental issues about welfare. Without health and food, anything else doesn't really matter. So I like the fact very much that your concern with welfare was really focused on, on the basic things. But I have a couple of questions about this. Um, one, one follows directly from that. Of course, it's nice to be healthy and um, not hungry, but we hope for more, of course. That's, that's just the bare minimum. And so one of the things I'm interested in is whether you saw any evidence that that health and hunger made it possible to, for people to make investments that raised their welfare more traditionally defined. So does the presence of digital finance, which is good for health and welfare, thereby lead to um, financial well-being? Let's put it that way. That, that's one question. The second question I have has to do looking at your results and say so you control for the presence of um, traditional forms of finance. And the fact that you control for it raises the question, is it the digital or is it the finance that's doing the work? And if it's the digital that's doing the work, why? How does that differ from traditional finance in a way that allows it to have a different effect? When I look at, at the tables, I don't remember the numbers, the tables in the four, the coefficients you get on digital finance are quite a bit bigger than the coefficients you get on bank accounts and formal loans and so on and so forth. What does that mean? I don't mean technically do the calculations and tell me the marginal effects and blah, blah, blah. I don't care about that. What does it actually mean in terms of the way finance digital finance, digital versus traditional, has the effects that you see in your data. Okay. Thank you, dear um, highly esteemed opponents for your kind words and also for your question. Yes, uh, chapter four looks at local digital lending development and the incidence of deprivation. And as you said, the focus was on food and health deprivation. And so, um, the, inter, the results suggest that the use of, of local digital lending development affect both health and welfare. And I also see that financial well being overall um, is being able to have um, the decision making power to be able to make decisions that affect your future. For example, it can be also be investment into your future and, and then a host of others. Um, the result, we've not really looked at digital lending development at the local level and its impact on, on financial well being. But there are studies which suggest that um, access to digital financial services is able to affect well being or financial well being, not just overall well being, but also financial well being. So, of course, there is an interlinkage between financial well being and well being because if local digital lending development is able to affect welfare, then there's also a possibility that one of the channels through which that can happen will be a financial well-being, which is not looking at just one dimension of financial access, but also other 
areas that could um, you know, improve or empower those that have access to it to be able to make meaningful use of the resources that they have. Um, so the second question um, about local digital lending development and also traditional bank services, whether it is the financial um, access to finance that is doing the job or it is the digital. I think I, I believe that one of the advantages of the digital is that um, you don't need to have collateral. So comparatively, uh, unlike traditional financial services that consumers need to have access to collateral, digital does not enable uh, or can be you know, given to consumers based on their uh, telecommunication record. Like using mobile phones can generate some histories that can be used to assess your credit worthiness. So it doesn't depend on collateral. And so I would say that it is not just the finance, but the digital is able to facilitate access to financial services, even to those who will originally not have access to traditional finance. And if you look at the result also, the result points out that um, those who are in underserved communities, like rural communities, tend to benefit more. And these are areas that are traditionally excluded from traditional financial services. And so um, I think the focus here will be that digital first and then the finance second. May I ask a follow-up, Pro Rector? Um, as you were saying this, I wondered, is this just a case of decreasing returns? No, I... So what I mean is, when you said you need collateral to get a financial loans, obviously, if you have collateral, you're richer. And therefore, um, the value of access to finance will be smaller just because of decreasing returns. Yes, I, I, I think that um, it is more of those that are at, at the verge of being excluded. So the benefit um, that we see is more for those that would not have access to traditional financial services, but are now able to access credit through alternative means. So the focus is about those that are um, the new entrant or the new beneficiaries of these services. And these tend to be um, those that are in areas that are originally underserved, like rural areas. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Michael Danke, who um, is a research fellow at UNU Writer and who is, uh, whose area of expertise is in issues on uh, productivity, and who was also a member of the assessment committee. The floor goes to Dr. Danke. M many thanks, uh, Pro Rector, and uh, congratulations. Uh, Gosway for the excellent uh, presentation. I have two brief, uh, you know, questions for you. The first one would be on the uh, chapter two, where you do find that mobile money has no effect on labor productivity. Could you please explain that further? For me, why is that so? Looking at the case of Sub Saharan Africa. Thank you, uh, dear ex uh, opponent, for your kind words and also for your question. Yes, in chapter two, indeed, we found that mobile money does not have a significant direct effect on labor productivity. And even though in, in most cases, this effect is positive, except that it's not statistically significant. And so it means that there, there are potential for this effect uh, to be realized, but at the moment or at the time that the data was collected, that effect was not obvious. And there are one possible explanation for this, um, and that is we look at mobile money um, used for transaction as a payment instrument and so mobile money itself is just a channel uh, where resources can be used in a much more lower, uh, with a much more lower cost. And then also we have on, on the other hand, the presence of traditional finance, uh, which 
is already found in the literature to affect family book level productivity. So the explanation I will give is that mobile money in itself is a medium um, that firms can use already existing resources to transact. And so uh, it has to be complementary, especially among formal firms, where we want to expect that there's both the presence of high value and also low value transactions. So mobile money, more advantageous for low value transaction. And so it's able to complement um, the already effect that we observe at the firm level. Many uh, things. I'll, I'll go on to my second question. So how does the thesis, uh, and, and you know, here I am looking at chapter uh, three, how does this relate to the role of informal institutions, the issues of transaction risk, and then labor productivity? Okay, thank you for your question and also for your kind words. Yes, chapter two, um, the, one of the mechanisms that we look at to explain our result is that of um, informal or uh, transaction relationship. So there's a relational contract in that sense. So this can be informal because it's not formally written. This is just based on trust, not on collateral. So the relationship between um, suppliers of trade credit and also receivers of trade credit is, is that is based on relational contract. So in that case, the contribution of mobile money in, in that relationship is that it's able to facilitate transaction at low cost first, and also able to, to facilitate liquidity improvements at the business level. So that will enable entrepreneurs to be able to be in a better position to offer goods and services on credit to customers, and also make them attractive for suppliers to offer, knowing that they have the probability to pay. Um, mobile money also, um, because it's not dependent on, on on, let's say, physical transfer of money. So it eliminates the risk of theft, theft in that relationship. And that risk of theft also has the potential to uh, you know, change default risk, which affect the, that informal contract between suppliers and also um, receivers of trade credit. And this, since access to credit, as chapter we found in chapter, chapter two, access to credit, um, has a positive influence on productivity. So we expect that if mobile money is able to affect access to external finance in the form of trade credit, then the next step will be, or the next hypothesis will be that it will also affect labor productivity, but this will have to be tested in future studies. Thank you very much. The, uh, thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor Dr. Fred Gold who is uh, a professor at the um, Swana University of Technology in South Africa, and whose area of expertise is measurement of innovation, and who was also a member of the assessment committee. The floor goes to Professor Gold. Thank you, uh, Prorector. There's a lot of dealing with the use, the financial use of smartphones, easing out desktops, laptops, landlines. This is a major technological uh, step in sub-Saharan Africa. In chapter two, table 2.1, uh, you present 14 countries using mobile money, which is interesting in its own right. But these are not the large economies in Africa. We don't see South Africa. We don't see Nigeria. Uh, in South Africa. So my question is, does the size of an economy influence your findings? And I'm sure you could see that from the information you got but if we included some of the much larger economies, would that change what you are concluding? So, and if so, how would it change it? So those are the questions. Thank you. 
Okay. Thank you, dear highly esteemed opponent, for your kind words and also for your question. Yes, chapter two um, mm -hmm. focused on 14 sub Saharan Africa, and the criteria we use to select these countries is the availability of mobile money uh, question in the World Bank Enterprise Survey. So the countries that we covered are countries that the World Bank Survey has covered um, using the mobile money questionnaire. And that means that we have, have secluded uh, major countries, like you've mentioned, South, 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 South Africa and also Nigeria. Um, but interestingly, um, in this country's mobile money use um, until recently was relatively low um, Nigeria, for example, mobile money uptake has been very low uh, over the last couple of years. Um, and also South, 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 South Africa, comparatively also mobile money uptake um, has been relatively low. And the major economies in terms of mobile money are in East Africa, and also secondly in, in West Africa. And these countries have been covered in, in the study. And so uh, I wouldn't expect in terms of relationship, that we've observed, I would not expect that um, the, the effect will be different if we extend uh, to the major economies such as Sub Saharan, uh, South Africa, and also Nigeria. This effect, uh, I expect that it to be the same. It will not differ. Thank you. Any follow up question, Professor Holt? No, I think that's a clear response. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the uh, opposition will be continued by uh, Dr. Lili Wang, who was who is a senior researcher at the uh, Unimerit and in particular um, has expertise in the economic innovation and emerging technologies. And she was the fourth member of the assessment committee. I'm happy to give the floor to Dr. Wang. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, um, Barak. Um, so, dear candidate. Dear Gosway, uh, at first, I also like to join others to congratulate you on uh, finishing your thesis. It is very interesting, uh, which I uh, uh, enjoyed a lot reading it. Um, so the thesis is very uh, structured. Uh, you have uh, uh, done quite interesting empirical analysis uh, in different chapters. And also you have a very nice uh, relevant literature review. So all in all, it's uh, quite interesting. Um, my question will be related to chapter three. Uh, in chapter three, you showed, the, uh, you showed that uh, uh, entrepreneurships, um, uh, entrepreneurs that who, uh, who use uh, mobile money for business transaction are uh, likely to receive goods and services uh, on, um, credit from suppliers. And in this chapter, you also mentioned that uh, you consider uh, endogeneity problems, for instance, uh, uh, estimating uh, the decision to use mobile money uh, for transactions and also the likelihood uh, to receive goods and services on credit from suppliers. Um, and also the choices uh, to offer credit to customers using uh, the three systems of uh, profit uh, equations. Um, so my first question is about the cap uh, capability of the uh, entrepreneurs um, that you tested in this chapter. So using mobile money represents a new way of doing business. And uh, firms adopting this uh, kind of method are, uh, I think, uh, likely uh, the advanced ones um, that have uh, really strong uh, capability. And they are also eager to, to learn new things. And probably they also adopt uh, other new technologies. And so if you have tried to handle endogeneity problem, um, so I'm wondering, how do you think uh, about the formal uh, capabilities and how do they really uh, influence the result inside of the mobile money? This is the first one. Uh, so my second question is also related to this chapter, <clears throat> um, which you deal with the uh, informal sectors. Um, 
uh, in different chapters, you also um, you also analyze uh, different sectors, as you know. Um, I'm wondering what is the difference um, between formal and informal sector uh, sectors, um, if you consider the uh, mobile money. And uh, so, why is it? Uh, why should mobile money work so differently in different types of sectors? Uh, what's your uh, early uh, reflections on this? Thank you. Okay, thank you, dear esteemed opponent, for your kind words and also for your question. Yes, the chapter two, um, we focus um, on mobile money used for transaction and also access to trade credit. Um, I see, I think, firm level capability as a potential, you know, a factor that can affect this relationship. And I also believe that capability is more diverse. So digital, uh, digital technologies also provide some digital capability at a firm level. And so we rather use mobile money as one of the possible ways that firm capability can be improved in terms of their likelihood to, to, to repay and therefore reducing default risks that can affect a trade credit relationship. But I also believe that there are other you know, factors that can contribute to capability, which we have not really looked at. Um, so that can be maybe managerial uh, capability. That can also be other levels of capability that include digital uh, technologies. Uh, but this can be captured by future studies. And I believe that is a very good question and also a very good uh, recommendation that maybe we can take up for our future studies. Uh, with regards to the question as to why mobile money is producing different results depending on the sector, I think there are uh, two possible ways um, that this can be explained. Um, the first one is the advantages that mobile money has over traditional financial services. And so mobile money is more cost effective Research have shown that it's more cost effective when it's being used for low value but high volume transactions. So it means that if you are conducting transactions that involve uh, lower amounts, then it's cheaper to use uh, mobile money uh, in a wallet. Why? Because in most countries, there's a limit, daily uh, transaction limit. And also, um, that there's also a, a limit at uh, the the amount that you can, tra can transact at each uh, transaction. So there's a cap on each transaction and also there's a cap on daily transactions. And so if you have higher amount of money, then it means that you have to transact in multiple uh, times and that can affect the, the cost of, of transactions. So the second reason is that traditional finance is more advantageous when high value but low volume transactions are involved. It means that if you are using the traditional banking sector, it is more cheaper if you are transacting huge sums of money from one account to the other. And also, it's also very much beneficial if you are doing wholesale payment. So these are the two possible ways that explain the result. How does this affect um, the, the various sectors? In the informal sector, we expect that low value transactions will be, will be more. And so the use of mobile money and therefore become beneficial at the informal sector where there is possibility of low value transactions. Whereas in the formal or among formal firms where we expect both mobile money, where we expect both low value and high value transactions, then a combination of traditional finance and mobile money becomes more advantageous to these firms because it gives them the advantage to use the payment instrument that is more cost effective at any given um, um, transaction that they face. So these are the mechanisms that explain our result. Okay, thank you very much. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Rasmus Lema, who is um, an associate professor with the area of expertise in economic innovation in the context of development at UNIMERIT. And the floor goes to Dr. Lema. Thank you very much, uh, Pro-Rector. Um, and hello, Godsway, uh, nice to meet you. Uh, and a big congratulations from, from my side uh, to you. 
I have read your uh, thesis with great interest. And I think, you know, in terms of, of the big picture, the, the, the overall reading, I think uh, what you do in this thesis is that you examine the different types of, of benefits there are from uh, financial innovation uh, in, in, um, in different ways uh, with different methods. And I think when I look throughout your findings and conclusions, what you show is exactly uh, that there are uh, um, different types of, of benefits from uh, financial innovation. So when reading through your conclusions, there was nothing uh, that, that, that really surprised me in terms of uh, you know, the, the complementarity between mobile money and um, uh, traditional financial services, uh, how mobile money um, decreases uh, deprivation uh, and so on. So this is of course important in its own right to do that. But nevertheless, my question to you is really, you know, of, of your findings, uh, what surprised you the most and why? Okay. Thank you, dear extreme opponent, for your kind words and also for your question. Yes, uh, I think the most surprising thing for, for our study is chapter two, uh, where we expect that uh, mobile money will have a significant direct effect. So that, that's the assumption from which we started um, the study. So the surprising element is that we did, we, we did not find um, that mobile money has significant direct effect on labor productivity. Rather, it tends to um, complement existing uh, traditional financial services that are available to the firms. And so that, that's one of the uh, surprising factors. And the second one um, that we found is in chapter five, where we, we show that um, countries at low levels of education, meaning that countries who do not have high proportion of their uh, population uh, educated tend to benefit more from digital infrastructure. And so how we explain this is that um, it shows that digital technology has the propensity uh, to reduce exclusion, especially um, giving better opportunity to those who do not have higher levels of education. And a, a case study is the mobile money, uh, provision in, in Sub-Saharan Africa that depend on agents to deliver these services. And most of these agents don't require high levels of, of education to be able to operate. So these are employment that digital technologies are providing at the base of the pyramid. So these are the surprises that uh, we are found in the thesis. On, on, the, on the first finding, uh, the lack of the direct effect uh, of mobile money. How, how do you explain that, the lack of direct effect on, on firm performance? Yeah, so the direct effect, um, the explanation that we can give is that um, it means that uh, among formal firms, because in, in the informal sector, we, have, we found direct effect. So among formal firms where high value and both uh, low value transactions are common, uh, then it's possible that uh, mobile money may not be having a significant effect because they already have access to traditional financial services. And so they can use these services given that it benefits them more. Um, but in the informal sector where um, they are likely to be excluded, then it's going to be uh, dependent on mobile money for low value transactions, which we also expect to, to benefit uh, that sector. So that would be my reaction. Thank you very much. This uh, concludes the first round of discussion. Uh, and that gives us an opportunity to go into a second round for which I would like to give the floor back again to Professor Dr. Cohen um, if he would have uh, any more questions and or issues to address. Thank you, Prorector. <clears throat> God's way. Um, this follows up a little bit on the previous question and has to do with your policy conclusions. And I have two not unrelated things I'd like to raise about that. Your overall policy conclusion at the end of the thesis was the government should support digital money or digital finance. That's um, pretty vanilla, if you like. Um, so one thing I'm curious about is what do you mean exactly? What They shouldn't just advertise we support digital finance. They should do something. So what, what is it that they should do? Which 
I want to connect with your conclusion from chapter four, which is roughly speaking, I'm putting words in your mouth a little bit, policy should be decentralized. Digital money policy should be um, at the local level. And I wonder why you say that. Is there nothing global about, about the policy that would support this stuff? I mean, is there nothing national? And is it actually regional or is it income? Is it regionally focused or is it income focused? Our previous discussion, you suggested, well, reading between the lines a little bit, income plays a big matter here. So maybe the issue is not a regional issue, it's a, an income issue. So it should be a central policy, but focused on a particular income group. So can you elaborate a little bit on those two kinds of ideas? Okay. Thank you for your question. Yes, um, the recommendation that we propose uh, at the end of the, the chapter or the thesis is that yes, both mobile money and traditional financial services should be encouraged and the, among formal firms and also at the informal sector, uh, mobile money should be encouraged and how can government achieve this? One of the ways is uh, mobile money to bank and you know, interoperability. So it means that if policies are put in place and in, in maybe in collaboration with, with the telecommunication companies that are largely the pro providers of mobile money, if there is a collaboration between policymakers and also telecos or mobile network operators uh, to, in, to make both mobile money, wallets, and bank account interoperable. It means that if you have mobile money account, you can easily transfer money to you know, your bank account. And if you also have bank account, you can also trans transfer money to your mobile money account. So that makes it easier in terms of transaction cost elimination. And one way that policymakers can also achieve this is through data sharing, where um, both all the providers in the mobile money ecosystem and traditional financial system are able to share data. And that opens the opportunity for those that are excluded, for example, that do not have access to traditional financial services, but only have access to mobile network operators account in the form of mobile money to be able to capitalize on some of these histories that they have with mobile network operators to also access the traditional financial market. Um, example would be um, using alternative ways to, um, to credit score potential consumers. That's one way. Second, uh, mobile money access can also be promoted at the informal sector um, by digitizing payments. We do know that uh, most transactions, especially in the informal sector, do take place in cash. So for example, agricultural payment, government to person payment, these are all transactions that can be digitized, meaning that if the government want to give social um, or maybe social assistance to the poor, they may include access to mobile money as one of the, the ways that you can access that fund. That can encourage people to join and to open a mobile money account. A typical example is this Togo where they have this you know, VC, uh, social transfer uh, digital project, and it's, it's estimated that roughly above 170,000 new accounts were added as a result of digitizing payment at the informal sector between government and then also uh, low income earners. So that's, that's, these are some of the ways that uh, financial inclusion can be promoted, both at the informal sector and also at the formal sector. And also with regards to decentralization, uh, in this case, we're looking at administrative region and this focus specifically on Kenya. So these are local government units that also have the, some level of autonomy to be able to make policies, to be able to make some decisions. And so the, the um, recommendation is that um, some of these local government can take up initiatives um, that can educate, for example, entrepreneurs um, to improve their literacy, financial literacy skills, and also digital skills. Um, and this can help them to overcome some of the barriers to use of financial services. Um, there, there's also a report by the Global Findex um, database that suggests that um, people or consumers that use mobile money, some of them are unable to use it without support. So it means that if they don't have 
people in the household or in their network that can take them through the process. They are unable to use the mobile and money services without support. So a financial literacy improvement, for example, will be something that local government can take up and, and also make sure that that barrier to effective use of financial services is reduced. Thank you. Yep. Shall we move on to uh, Dr. Michael Dunque, if you would have any more questions or observations in the second round? Thank you very much. I, I would want to have just a couple of uh, clarifications. Uh, uh, Gosway, did you find that uh, mobile money has a positive and a, a significant effect on labor uh, productivity in the informal uh, sector? Is that what you just indicate? No, in the informal sector, we didn't test that, but it's a hypothesis that maybe we can take up in future studies. Yes, because I just I just wanted to uh, draw your attention that even within the informal sector, there are different tiers. There are those that can be found in the lower tier, right? Those who are mainly sub systems and then there are those who are in the upper uh, tier and uh, therefore work that has been done although a bit pre preliminary shows that those who do benefit from things like digitalization or you know mobile money are those who are in the in the what do you uh, call it the upper tier of the informal sector and, and so th those below don't, still don't uh, seem to take advantage of, 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 you know, this. So that was the, uh, you know, the, you know, you know, a remark I wanted to make here. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for your suggestion. Okay. The uh, third member that would be given a second opportunity in this second round would be Professor Dr. Gold, if he would have any more questions or issues to address. Thank you, uh, Prorector. In what I do, I'm going to pose a question which might be excessively pedantic. But we look at the thesis and we see financial innovation throughout, which is not a surprise. And I see financial innovation as a subset of innovation. So my question, I think, is what do you mean by financial innovation? And then what do you learn from its measurement? I invite you to respond to that. Thank you for, for your question. Yes, um, we use financial innovation in this case um, to refer to two main innovations in, in digital financial services. The first one is mobile money account ownership. So if you have mobile or if you use mobile money for transaction, you are captured as using an innovation in the financial sector. And the second one is digital credit. If you are able to access loans using uh, your mobile phones or via mobile money platforms or apps, then we also um, uh, give it that definition that you are using the financial innovation. Um, that is, uh, if we define innovation as a, CD, a new product or process or significantly improved product, and then these are new uh, innovative uh, services in the financial services. So that qualifies it as innovation. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Um, let us move to uh, Dr. Lili Wang. Uh, would you have a second uh, question or observation in the second round? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, uh, Director. Um, so, Gosway, um, to my earlier question, you explained the difference between the impact of mobile money on formal and the informal sectors. Now, let's focus on the formal sectors. 
that are associated with uh, larger uh, transitions in the informal sectors. Uh, in chapter two, you showed that uh, mobile money uh, does not necessarily have a uh, um, significant uh, direct uh, effect. And it's, it, uh, it needs to be combined with the traditional financial uh, certain situations. Um, so it's a conditional on other uh, financial uh, financial productivity. Um, so for, uh, from here, should we conclude that uh, mobile money should be introduced with great caution? Uh, or will you still think that mobile money should be promoted equally to informal and formal sectors? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Yes, um, I think you, that in chapter two, um, the evidence suggests that overall, um, the use of mobile money alone does not have direct or significant effect. But when we focus specifically in, in East Africa, where adoption is high, we find a significant effect of mobile money use on productivity. So it means that um, in areas that are fairly developed, where mobile money can solely be dependent upon without incurring additional transaction costs, uh, we expect that there should be some significant effect on, on firms. Um, so based on this, the policy recommendation is that uh, among formal firms, both mobile money and traditional financial services should be, to be, or should be promoted. Why? Because uh, banking infrastructure is still limited in sub-Saharan Africa context. We have fewer bank branches in poor neighborhoods such as rural areas. So if a firm, a formal firm is transacting business with a supplier who may be excluded from the traditional financial services, then it makes sense that the, that business is able to use mobile money for such transaction because the use of alternative means will be more expensive given the distance and also given that such um, a transaction will either be transacted in cash, which also has its own disadvantages such as the risk of theft or other potential ones such as appropriation. So among formal firms, the recommendation is that both should be provided so that entrepreneurs have the choice to use the payment instrument or the service that best suits their interests given a particular transaction a situation. So that's the recommendation. Thank you. Uh, as as we still have a few more minutes, uh, I would like to give uh, Dr. Lima the opportunity for a short question or short observation uh, to discuss with uh, the candidate. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Pro Rector. So I think I, I get the last question. So I think a good way to to round this uh, off is also to look um, at, at the really big pictures and and going a little bit beyond uh, the core of your thesis. So. I would like to return to um, the, the point made by Professor Cohen in the very beginning. And uh, this is about the opportunities uh, for building on mobile phones, mobile phone use, experiences with mobile money for developing a different development path, um, opportunities for leapfrogging. So of course, as also Professor Gold mentioned, you know, here we have a, a, a case of leapfrogging, uh, um, a going um, um, directly to mobile uh, phones, skipping landlines. Um, but basically what we are seeing here, uh, uh, for instance, in, in Kenya with uh, M-Pesa is a lead market in, in mobile money. So all of that experience is uh, being built up with mobile money. To what extent do you think that provides opportunities for leapfrogging also in, in other areas. So development of entirely new business models, uh, new to the world business models um, uh, originating in, in that lead market or completely new ways of developing uh, and organizing health services. So um, building on, on, on your many years of work with, uh, with this kind of technology, what, what's your assessment of, of that question? Okay. Thank you very much for your question. Yes, um, I think mobile money has, has provided um, the experiments that sub-Saharan Africa needs to be to transform their economies. 
Um, an example that you've mentioned is, is Kenya. And Kenya has been very instrumental in, in first with the MPESA. And then we've also seen that the digital economy has grown uh, to also include the provision of credit via digital platform. So that's an opportunity for growth, not only in the service sector, but also um, businesses being able to access finance uh, through alternative means or alternative finance. So that has a potential area that businesses can grow. And also in terms of the provision of services, I think there's also a huge potential for the financial services sector uh, to grow, uh, given the, the opportunity that mobile money has brought and the added value that we have seen over the couple of over the, the, the next or the last couple of, of years. Um, open banking. <laughs> You may briefly conclude your response. Uh, please go ahead. Yes, yeah, so open banking is also a, a huge potential for Africa to explore. And I believe that that can also be a part to growth. Thank you. Godfrey Korku Dete, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed and the degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our research.
Yes, here we are again. Um, Gotswe Korku Tete. With the Greek committee here present online has assessed the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. And in view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committed has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Dr. Pierre Monin is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. Um, and I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. The floor is yours, uh, Professor Monin. Thank you, Prime Godsway, do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. Thank you. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present online, I hereby confer upon you God's way, Korkutete, the degree of doctor, and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, you will soon receive the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the supervisor, affixed with the official seal of the university, as shown by the Beadle. Professor Morning, the floor is still yours. Oh. All right. <clears throat> so, God's way, congratulations to you, your wife, your family. Um, let me go back a little bit in time. So, five years when you started, I remember that. And in the meantime, you have contributed to different activities in the Institute, teaching, helping to uh, supervise students in our master's program. Back in 2019, I asked you to help me in organizing the MEDA conference uh, in, that took place in Abidjan, Côte d'Ivoire. You kindly accepted and you were very efficient. Uh, you acted as a tutor for a FinTech and regulatory innovation course at Cambridge University in the UK. You collaborated with uh, some other students in our PhD program, in particular Gideon and uh, Chucks. Yeah, I think you wrote a paper together. So you have been quite active uh, in, in our PhD program. Now, like most PhD students, you also faced some problems during your PhD journey. The most recent one was at the beginning of this year, uh, when you started to put up together all the pieces of your thesis, and you found out that for chapter one, there was just a paper that got published on the same topic. And yeah, that was a bit of a problem, but since you were working on many other papers, you uh, could replace this first paper on which you had spent some time, unfortunately, by another of your papers, and that solved that problem. Also in 2019, you had planned to write a qualitative chapter on uh, e-commerce uh, with one of our former uh, colleagues in Tokyo, uh, you raised money for that uh, research budget to undertake the field work, and then came the COVID pandemic. Uh, you couldn't travel to Ghana, unfortunately. It would have been nice also for you to, to visit your family. So you had to give up that field work and you had to give up uh, that uh, particular chapter. Uh, again, you, you found a, a solution for going to secondary data and uh, keeping maybe this project for uh, uh, another paper after your PhD thesis. And actually, we, uh, um, we recommend you to, to keep working on this because it, it is an interesting issue 
the issue of e-commerce and entrepreneurship in Africa. Um, you also try to submit some papers of your thesis, uh, and unfortunately, that didn't always work out. Uh, doesn't mean that you shouldn't keep uh, working on it. Maybe uh, look at it from a different perspective. Uh, in particular, try to find uh, data that are um, maybe panel data that would allow you to, to solve this endogeneity problem that has always been a problem, and which is a problem for many of us. But on the other hand, also, you got two papers published, uh, one in telecommunications policy and one in small business economics. So that's very good. Now, on a more personal note, and, and I think I also speak here in the name of uh, Michelin and uh, Marty, it, it has been really a pleasure to, to supervise you. It was easy. You were an easy student to supervise. Um, always very friendly, polite, respectful, and in a sense, very formal. Uh, you wouldn't knock on our door or send us emails very often from time to time. You would send us a very formal email, the type uh, with a heading request for a meeting. And it was very short, generally very short email, starting with, I trust this email finds you well, <laughs> and finishing by, I look forward to comments and feedback. And uh, so two, three sentences. Uh, we would have our meeting. And after the meeting, we would get another email, a thank you note, thank you for your comments and a summary of what had been discussed. And a few weeks, a month later, we would get the final, the, the final chapter of that, uh, that, that we had discussed. So you are very independent, um, hardworking, uh, reliable. Um, something I forgot to mention, you also uh, went to visit South Africa. And I think uh, in the uh, uh, chain project that uh, Micheline was heading, and I think that has been a good experience for you, uh, spending some, some time at Barney uh, University. Now, the last thing I would like to, to say uh, about you, if I, after many years, would like to remember who was God's way, Tete. Uh, you are a man of surprises. Uh, surprise, for instance, when you would, you know, send us a chapter which was, even the first version of a chapter, which was almost, you know, a, a chapter almost finished in a sense. It would have an introduction, it would have a data section, it would have a methodology section, the results, the conclusion, everything would be there just for us to read, give comments, you know. It's, it's, uh, that's the way you operate. Uh, so that's, that's quite nice. Secondly, uh, when you were looking, hunting for a job, I was asking you what, what kind of job are you looking at? And you told me you wanted to have some experience, uh, maybe work for an international organization. So you once asked me to write a letter of recommendation. I don't remember for which organization it was. I think it didn't work out. And then shortly afterwards, you, you uh, wrote me uh, an email saying that you had been in discussion with Strathclyde University in the UK. And basically you asked me a letter, and I wouldn't even say a letter of recommendation, a letter of confirmation in a sense. So that's again, surprising. And then lastly, uh, at one point you told us that you got married. We never, you never told us anything about your private life. So this is the kind of person that you are. Well, thank you very much. It was a nice, it was really a pleasure. And I think I speak in the name of Micheline and Marty to supervise you. We, um, we hope that we have uh, been useful to you, that we have uh, a little bit contributed to human, you, your human capital. And we wish you all the best in your career. Thank you. Once again, congratulations. Dear Dr. Porku Tepes, also, on behalf of the Maastricht University, I congratulate you with the degree you have acquired. And I hereby, after thanking the members of the assessment committee, the, you all members now as a degree committee, um, your supervisors, everyone who contributed. And I, of course, congratulate also your, your, your family and, and, and your friends uh, with the uh, wonderful result that you have achieved. I, but I hereby 
need to declare 